<laughs> okay, hello and welcome to uh, in session number 18, I believe this is. Yeah. We, have mm -hmm. a very, we have two very, very special guests today joining us from the um, um, Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, short version is Karma. So we have David Braun and Go Wang. Uh, David is a master's student at Stanford and Go is a professor. And from the der derivative team, we have Malcolm Bouchard and Greg Hermanovic. Thanks for joining us, guys. And uh, in case you haven't heard, today we're taking a deep dive into two of the music software frameworks David Braun has published for Touch Designer. Faust and Chuck Designer, and Ge, as the chief designer, will introduce and demo Chuck and talk about Chuck in interactive audiovisual design and practices and, and the things he teaches at Stanford. So just a quick, quick intro here. Uh, Ge researches uh, artful design of tools, toys, games, musical instruments, virtual reality, and social experiences. A, two, a 2016 Guggenheim Fellow goes the author of Artful Design, Technology in Search of the Sublime, which I should be getting at some point during the show. And <laughs> and how and David, who is pretty legendary oh, there's the book. Thank you, David. Um, David who who doesn't really need much of an introduction, uh, quite legendary in our community for all of his contributions. Um, is a software developer and artist working in real time, uh, interactive media audiovisual design and machine learning and more. Yeah, would probably be nice to just point out um, some of the URLs that you might want to check out when looking at uh, David's work as well as uh, the dirt.design. And um, also the uh, GitHub from David is extremely uh, giving. Like just check out the touch designer shared folder and dive into the repositories there. Um, there's so much good stuff in that. Uh, can't really go over this. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's a great contribution as well, you did a talk at the Touch Designer Summit in Montreal on quantitative easing. And I, if I'm not completely mistaken, out of that basically the uh, uh, phaser chop came to be. Uh, first, Correct, uh, yes. yeah. So um, this yeah. is a direct impact on the software. Uh, from your side, um, a really useful tool there as well. Yes, yeah, small direct con uh, contribution to the software. Yes, thank thanks for supporting that. Yeah, it's great. And I was really blown away by your talk, and I encourage people to look at the uh, the um, our, our, our our summit um, presentation that you gave. And, and the op snippets for it, because the phaser chop comes with op snippets now. Yeah, which um, which which are in tops as well. Yeah. Well, David, can I pull it over to you for a little bit? Okay, great. So I'll go uh, full screen. We'll go full screen. All right. So the talk today is coding Faust inside Chuck inside Touch Designer, a Turchukin of musical programming. And that's because they're so nested together, and I have all these custom operators working in, in detailed, intricate ways. So that's that's the title. So we'll be covering these two different programming languages and how they integrate with Touch Designer. Uh, first, a little background on me. Uh, starting in 2015, Touch Designer and working at Leviathan in Chicago were my gateway to fun professional projects and programming experience. On the right, that's 150 North Riverside in Chicago, a very large media wall uh, in which I, alongside other developers and uh, project managers, made uh, real-time content with Touch Designer for it. So through this work experience, I've done GLSL and compute shaders, LED video walls and touch screens, computer vision, point clouds, and C++ programming. And that was great in terms of all kinds of human, human computer interaction, but it wasn't necessarily a lot of audio. And so that uh, wanting to do more work in audio programming, I applied for a master's uh, program at the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, CARMA, uh, at Stanford University. I started in September 2020. And students and faculty have backgrounds in many fields, including psychoacoustics and human perception of sound and music, music theory, composition, intermedia performance, and ethnomusicology architectural acoustic spaces, acoustic devices like speakers, and immersive audio such as ambisonics, uh, signal processing, 
low latency audio streaming. The project that is emblematic of that is called Jack Trip for very low latency streaming of audio uh, with a low compression or even un non compressed audio over the internet. Jack Trip, if you search for that. Uh, and finally, computer music languages, artful design, human computer interaction. And that is uh, part of the overlap with uh, Gawang, who's joining us, Professor Gawang, who's joining. And so we'll be, we'll be sharing the presentation today. Uh, another very important person in this uh, mishmash of uh, audio signal processing and computer music languages is Julia Smith. He's a professor of music and by courtesy electrical engineering at Stanford. He has thousands and th uh, like hundreds, thousands of citations. He's the author of great free textbooks on and articles on signal processing. So if you go to his homepage, you'll find great introductory material to signal processing that is useful for uh, programming in Faust. His many contributions include digital waveguide synthesis, physical modeling, and many contributions to the Faust and Faust libraries. So for instance, if you need a low pass filter, you don't need to code that low pass filter yourself. It's because he, alongside other Faust developers, have implemented those functions that are ready uh, for you to just plug into other uses uh, and make uh, more uh, higher level functions within Faust. And next we have Gawang. He is the Associate Professor of Music in, and by courtesy computer science at Stanford. Uh, and he, on the right, uh, he created Chuck during his PhD at Princeton. And on the right, we have Ocarina. That's an iOS app uh, that makes music. And he will uh, demo that later. And he's also the author of Artful Design, Technology in Search of, of the Sublime. It's a photo comic book about artful design. He's the director of the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, orchestra known as Slork. And he teaches Music 256A, Music Computing Design, The Art of Design. And uh, that course, Music 256A, is based on Chuck and Unity. Uh, Chuck, the programming language, and Unity, the game engine. And uh, being inspired by taking that course, I thought, well, why not make Chuck and Touch Designer? So that's how Chuck, Chuck Designer came about. And this is a brief history of computer music languages. Uh, right in the middle, over, over here, we have Chuck and Faust. And uh, I, I'll turn on my mouse uh, trail later. Uh, but we have Chuck and Faust coincidentally at the same time that I think Touch Designer started, which was the uh, early 2000s. And there are these two similar uh, but also divergent uh, approaches to making music. And I think that I'll give a little bit of background of, and motivation for using Faust and Chuck inside Touch Designer. So. Uh, we, we want to use Touch Designer for audio and analysis of many channels. So suppose you have a stereo signal that's just left and right. We want to have more of the ingredients that make up that sound so that we can analyze the, the individual components and use that to make audio reactive visualizations. Uh, secondly, uh, Touch Designer is great for visuals, so we want to keep our visuals close to the audio, gen audio generating and affecting process. We want to make uh, custom user interfaces for both Faust and Chuck. We want to build uh, Faust and Chuck uh, code base to reuse so that you can just drag a tox in and, and use it for some purpose, a tox that you've uh, come to know and, uh, and use often. And we want the, uh, the plugins to work perfectly in, in non-real-time mode, which they do. And also, if you are in real-time mode, even if you're dropping a few video frames, so suppose your project is 60 frames per second, but you go down to 50 frames per second because it's dro dropping video frames, we still want the audio to not have artifacts. And so that is tested right now in the plugins. And we hope that uh, by introducing these plugins, Faust and Chuck, inside Touch Designer, it'll lead to even uh, more interesting uses of Touch Designer, such as live coding and Algo Rave. I would encourage you to look up some video demonstrations of those on YouTube or some other uh, video platform and see if those interest you. And we can make a culture out of uh, live coding in, in Touch Designer and see how that goes. Uh, next, uh, there's the question of where do the, the plugins intersect? Where, where do the actual plugins have commonality? And both should be working on Mac OS and Windows, especially the non-experimental versions of these plugins. Uh, the both plugins can take a chop with any number of channels and output chop data with any number of channels. So it's really up to you, the user, to say, I'm going to write my code in a certain way to expect this number of inputs and this number of outputs, and it will do that for you for both uh, kinds of plugins. Both plugins support user-defined sample rates like 44,100 uh, hertz or 48,000 hertz. 
both can read WAV files and manipulate them. So if you want to just play back a sound file in an interesting way to change the uh, read position of it, play it backwards, anything like that, uh, these plugins do that very well. Both plugins won't cook unless something is telling them to cook. And that's really great. So you can use a switch, uh, a switch chop, for example, to divert the signal so that it's not cooking and that'll save the computation. But in case you did want an always cook uh, feature, that, that will be coming in the future. And you can use as many plugin instances as you want in a project. So you can chain them together. And a good workflow that I found is that you can take uh, a Chuck uh, plugin and you can generate a kind of mi uh, MIDI melodic information. And you can use that to drive a Faust uh, plugin that is making the sound. And you can, you can go even further than that. You can go Faust to Chuck. Anything is possible. And part two on how they inter intersect, Chuck Designer already has lots of Python interface methods. So you can set things known as global variables, such as floats and arrays. And uh, TD Faust will gain some MIDI related ones in the future. And those will mimic how the audio VST chop works, where you can say note on or note off for a given channel pitch and velocity. When making user interfaces, you must think about control rate versus sample rate. And it's a feature, not a bug. This is one of the intricacies of uh, audio programming, but it will serve you well if you uh, understand it. And we'll be discussing that later in the presentation. So about uh, the, the difference between control rate, which is about affecting uh, user sliders and interfaces. So if you have uh, in Touch Designer, like a, a custom parameter that you're moving with your, your mouse and the, and the value slider, that is only going to be changing at the video frame rate of the project. But audio is changing at audio rate, which is, might be 44,100 hertz. So that discrepancy can cause issues, but we'll go over that more. And next, uh, I'm just going to give like a 30 second introduction to the two languages. So on the left, we have Faust. And in, it, notice that it doesn't have variable definition type. So you don't use the word float or you don't use the word integer. Everything kind of works as a function. So it's, called, it's a functional language. So on the left, we import a standard library. And we want to actually define, uh, I think, a, a, a function called frequency. So we take the MIDI pitch 60 and we pipe it or use the colon connector into the basics library, BA for basics, and then MIDI key to hertz. And so that's going to turn 60 into the frequency in hertz of that, of that C, uh, middle C note. And then with that value of whatever the frequency is, we uh, plug that into os.osc, and that's a sine oscillator. And then we use this funny syntax of the open uh, the less the less than sign and the colon and that is the uh, kind of open pipe uh, uh, operator and then we say split that one channel into two channels and then that defines our process so this is going to make a stereo signal that's 44 hertz now on the right we have chuck and notice that uh, it's a it actually would be a a, uh, a a strongly typed language because you will def you will define variables so you'll use keywords like float and, uh, in, and integer to define uh, variable types. And we define a sine oscillator named S, and that goes into the DAC. That's the, the digital to audio converter. And now the next line shows some similarity with Faust, where we take the number 60 and we use the chuck operator, that's the equal sign and the greater than sign, and we chuck it into the standard library for MIDI2 frequency. And then we chuck that again into the frequency parameter of the sine oscillator. And now in the bottom section, this is where Chuck is very interesting and it has something known as uh, strongly timed uh, programming. And so we have a, a true loop or a while true loop that's always going to be true. And in that true loop, we Chuck 100 milliseconds to now. So that's telling the Chuck language to kind of evaluate 100 milliseconds of audio given everything that, that has already been expressed to the system so far. So we've, we've, we've made this connection between a sine oscillator and the digital to audio converter. So it's saying evaluate that for 100 milliseconds. And this, this feature about explicitly passing time to now, I think that that is uh, what is essentially the strongly timed uh, feature of Chuck. And where do Faust and Chuck diverge? Well, Faust is great at making efficient audio processors with debuggable diagrams. And I would recommend using the Faust IDE uh, for making, for writing and prototyping your Faust code. I'll, I'll demonstrate that later. And it'll show you uh, great diagrams to make sure that you're programming uh, the, the circuits correctly. The Faust libraries are extensive and you can search for Faust libraries and, and, and browse them. 
And the Faust code can, deployed in, can be deployed in many other languages and platforms, C++, Juice, WebAssembly, Rust, Julia, VC, VRAC, and more. And finally, Faust can be deployed on hardware, such as TNC, Bella, FPGA, ESP32, and many others. So one of the courses at Stanford is physical, uh, physical interaction design for musical instruments. And in that course, you learn Faust and you, uh, use, that, that you use Faust to export to C++, and then you compile C++ for a microcontroller, such as a TNC. And you use other sensors, photoresistors, et cetera, to make great uh, physical interaction design for music. Chuck, uh, in contrast to Faust, is, has great strengths in timing, events, melodies, rhythms, and musical scores. It's more about the big picture of music. And w the essential feature of Chuck is sporking a shred, for, also known as forking a thread in, in the non-lexicon of Chuck. And that's critical to Chuck's power. And this feature, sporking a shred, is also known as con concurrency. It's about the parallelism of Chuck. And Chuck also emphasizes Kind of partitioning uh, the logic in, in different ways so you can you can have your score and you can have your instruments and you can have your effects and so you can think about all these things independently and plug and play and that is in, great to the design of chuck whereas faust it's kind of like you're going to compile your code and you're just going to run it but chuck can do uh, uh more dynamic uh things in terms of uh, making an audio graph and and executing that graph and, but finally, Chuck can do low-level signal processing in a readable way. So you can actually make a function that's, that is deter that what the function does is write every sample. It does a, 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 a tiny calculation of what every next audio sample needs to be, and it'll execute that. But because of the virtual machine that runs Chuck, it, it can be a little slow. So you might want to use Faust for uh, some of your uh, audio processor needs. And uh, now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Professor Gawang. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, well, um, I'm going to do my best to uh, follow um, the exquisite uh, introduction uh, for, for Faust Chuck and, and uh, kind of setting the stage for a uh, Faust Chuck designer, um, as it were. So um, I'm going to pick up on this and uh, give you kind of a more of a, a bit of the kind of a brief history of Chuck, um, a bit more of the brief history, as well as just some things on the main Chuck and just a quick demo of Chuck. Um, and, uh, but before I begin, I just want to say when, when David says Chuck is probably slower than Faust, I think he's being very generous to Chuck. Um, Chuck is like definitely slower. In fact, I would say Chuck, um, Chuck may actually be like the least efficient audio programming language that's ever been made. Um, but that's not where its strength is at. You know, it, it, it does run in real time. It tries its, it tries its best. But um, I think Chuck is really about kind of this access to like very deterministic control over time and parallelism, as, as David said. So, uh, so with that, um, I, I wanna, I'm going to try to put into um, pictures, some of the, some of the things that David talked about. Um, so actually, so yeah, David, and I actually, we, we do our work in that building in the chimney way in the back, um, behind Memorial church, it's really kind of the edge of campus at Stanford. Um, and we're in that building, actually in the foreground, we see actually Mich Roman Michonne, who's one of the, uh, core developers on the Faust language. And he's also my co-author when we made Falk, which is already kind of this, is not a turducken yet. It's kind of when Faust and Chuck kind of merged into a kind of unholy uh, amalgam. Um, but I think, um, but I think it, I'm really glad to see that uh, we have gone yet one level deeper in the nesting. And on this note, um, I just want to say also just a note of thanks to like just the incredibly welcoming touch designer community. Um, and uh, and then through David, I've seen just how much power, but also how much camaraderie and community is actually like here. So, um, and so I think it goes well with this turducken idea that it's like mutually like inviting and inclusive. So I'm, I just wanna, I just wanna give a shout out to that. So yeah, we're, we're in this building and that is Karma and that's me in my office. Um, and yeah, I build tools. I like to tell people I do this thing I call um, critical making, um, what, what others have called critical making, which is really not only building tools, but also really thinking 
as broadly as possible about their implications um, for people, for communities, um, and uh, and also for creative expression. So I make programming languages, musical instruments, toys, games, uh, VR, um, and artificial intelligence systems with humans in the loop, um, but really all in the service of trying to help people to be more creative. Um, Chuck is one of those things, and um, and it's open source, it's freely available. I like to say it crashes equally well on all commodity operating systems, and it's been around, as David uh, noted, really kind of since uh, 2002. So it's really about 20 years for, like, you know, I think all these languages that we're actually talking about between Faust, uh, Touch Designer, and Chuck. I also work with the Laptop Orchestra, which uses Chuck, as well as the Stanford VR Design Lab, which we have, among other things, we use Chuck as a kind of a, the audio synthesis side in Tunity, which is Chuck in Unity. Um, I also, uh, so uh, like I said, I like to think a lot about kind of not only build things, but also think really hard about this and then trying to put the thinking back into the building. And all of that is wrapped up in this other, I guess, design work is a, that, that is artful design. And as David said, it's a photo comic book. So these are the kind of things I work in. Now to contextualize Chuck a little bit more, so this is actually from a page from Artful Design, uh, which is looking at a, a non-exhaustive list of computer music programming languages, right? And you might recognize a few of these, and Chuck is just one of those that's in there. And this kind of strongly timed aspect that uh, David spoke to is really kind of the thing that makes Chuck, um, you know, it's, I guess they say, a, a tool... A programming language, each programming language should, you know, kind of give you a kind of a different way of thinking about solving the same problem. So I think it's probably the reason why we have so many languages and why it's actually really cool when different languages kind of come together, because then you can really try to take advantage of the of, of the respective advantages of each system. So for Chuck, yeah, it is a strongly time musical programming language. It originated during my PhD at Princeton uh, to my on the on this side here, that's that's Perry Cook, that's was, who was my PhD advisor, and uh, and he sanctioned this. In fact, he encouraged it, and he he's he and I really kind of were the originators of um, of Chuck, um, and it, you know, really what this is about, as you can see, kind of on the right here, it's it's actually about trying to control sound over time. You know, it's really, you know, some level programming sound, at least in Chuck, is really about programming time. And that leads to this idea of strongly timed. And so I'm going to take that, the Chuck code that that um, that David showed, and I'm going to try to give you a demo of this. And just try to um, make sure I've got all my volume right. Let's see, let's do that. So you can instantiate a sign ask. Um, call it foo. You can use the Chuck operator, Chuck it to the DAC. Um, and you can do things like, you know, 440 Chuck to foo dot freak. So if we do that, we'll change and send the frequency to 440. And Chuck being a strongly timed language, you have advanced time. Let's do that by two seconds. And if I do this, I'm going to make sure it's also not too loud here. Setting the gain. So we should hear that sine wave for two seconds. And so we can copy and paste this. And we can say 220, 440, 880. And do half a second, half a second, one second. And now we produce a kind of sequence over time. We can then wrap that up in an infinite loop. We end up writing a lot of infinite loops <laughs> somehow in Chuck. Um, and let's see, if we do this, now we have this kind of very crude automation. Next up, if you take out this kind of hard coding and say math.random2f between 30 and 1000, chuck that as foo's frequency, now this changes to half a second. Every half a second now we have a new random frequency. You can keep making this faster. 200 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. I always like to pause here and say, I think this is, at this point, I feel like we've achieved some kind of canonical, like, computer music. It's kind of
kind of like uh, like in the old sci-fi movies. It's uh, kind of like the uh, hello world of uh, computer music. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> and, and it encapsulates uh, the bleep bloop as well. It is. It is the. It is. It is the essential bleep loop, um, and it's all one sine wave, and can keep going. And Chuck, um, if you go down to like ten milliseconds, you can go to one millisecond. Right, and so that's all like basically part of the strongly time. In fact, you can actually advance time one sample at a time, and it's going to keep true and deterministic to that. And that's really kind of this. this, this half of these what we mean by strongly timed the other half is something i won't won't have time to show you which is really kind of this idea that david talked about sporking which is you can have parallel logic that's happening at the same time and chuck automatically synchronizes these parallel shreds of of logic actually through the way they advance time so you, you don't actually have to worry about like the trickiness of synchronizing concurrent concurrency is kind of done for you because Chuck already deals with time. So that's, you know, just a quick um, intro into into this. And by the way, you can keep going in the direction we saw a second. You can do minute, you can do day, you can do week. If we do this, right, next Friday, this, if I were to play this, in exactly one week, there will be a new random frequency. Um, and you can keep going. So using the same framework, you can really talk about things at like a very small time scale as well as very large time scales. So concurrency, you can have as many time scales running at the same time as you want. Um, now, um, what can we do? You know, what more can we do with this? Well, quite a bit, right? There's a lot of unit generators and they're meant to be building blocks for sound generation. I just want to show you something else here uh, that's been made with Chuck. So just to give you a sense uh, before I hand things back over to uh, to David is, you know, what, what are some things you can do with Chuck? Well, he, here's an example that I use in class a lot, which is a, it's, a, it's an emulation of the THX deep note. You know, that that sound that I think was first actually premiered in, in, in the theaters in the late 70s, the Return of the Jedi, um, was when this THX deep note really was created. And this is um, actually composed by um, Andy Moore. Uh, one of the founding members of Karma, actually, um, but also, you know, the creator of the Deep Note. Here in Chuck, we're going to emulate it with one Chuck program that has 30 voices that start out on one random that's going to go to basically 10 different pitches. And that's going to be basically pitches that stack up to this big chord. Um, so uh, I'm just going to go ahead and play it. And, um, and the code looks something like this. It's about 150 lines of code. Um, in fact, actually, more like 100 lines of code because the top is just comments. And here, well, let's go ahead and take a listen. So in this case, Chuck is using kind of the stylish, strongly time mechanism to like really incrementally change um, the frequencies of these 30 uh, different voices, these different 30 different solitudes, um, and ramping them and having them converge on this chord at the end. So this is a way to really kind of describe how you want things to sound over time. Um, in in through the years, you know, Chuck is you know there's a whole community of of Chuck developers and terrifyingly uh, to me, Chuck users, because uh, while I'm very thankful, I'm also, I also know where all the potholes are in Chuck. Um, so I'm ever grateful for the community. Uh, so here's the TX checks code, which looks something like this. But then it's also using things like instrument design from the Princeton Laptop Orchestra to the Stanford Laptop Orchestra um, with folks like Dan Truman. Uh, here's an early photo of actually like teaching in the laptop orchestra, teaching Chuck actually, in the Princeton Laptop Orchestra uh, some 15, 17 years ago. And also here's people actually, you know, kind of over the years of the laptop orchestra making instruments, making sounds, and and uh, building these speakers that keep sound local to the instrument. Um, here is kind of an example of the laptop orchestra. 
which is one of hundreds of pieces that have been premiered, many of them made using Chuck. What is the controller? So the controller is a game track. Um, So yeah, the, so, so the controller, the, the game track is really was like a kind of these two tethered controllers, which senses the 3D locations of your two hands. Originally made to be a kind of a golf game controller, it can kind of track your swing, um, but that didn't work out so well. Um, but the controller itself was picked up by like computer music researchers who were like, whoa, this is such a cool thing to prototype with. So we have like a, like, like a warehouse, a small warehouse of these things that we use in the laptop orchestra and for other things. Um, and Chuck has also made its way into mobile. Uh, so here is Ocarina, which is um, an app. When I came to Stanford, I did not intend to start a company, but uh, that's. But within a year, I ended up co-founding Smule, um, which is really a mobile mu music company. Um, and it's because the iPhone and the App Store came online. Um, and so one of the first things that that I designed that was an instrument as part of Smule was the Ocarina. And uh, let me just give you a, a quick demo. So this is actually a Chuck, Chuck programs running in it that's actually generating sound, but also mapping the sensor input into the sound. Um, and you play it by blowing into the microphone at the bottom of the phone. Multi-touch controls pitch, vibrato is controlled by the tilt of your phone. And tilting left and right actually controls vibrato rate. And you play little ditties with this. <laughs> and then it's a fun and... Um, You're like the Pied Piper of Stanford. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> bro. <laughs> and let's make music together. Um, and uh, and this is actually the the, di the signal diagram for kind of the unit generators within Chuck that's actually responsible for generating the sound and and actually having it also taking into account the breath input, the accelerometer data, and the multi-touch info, and using that to actually generate this sound. This is Ocarina in gameplay mode. And you can kind of see it's really kind of this like audio visual interactive thing, kind of what David is talking about with kind of really building, why he's building Faust into Chuck into Touch Designer is to try to really kind of create systems that speak to all of these different modalities. Um, and there's one, if there's one more, then this is actually a social dimension. And Ocarina is other people alone to their phones from around the world. Who are these people? Well, the app is designed to not tell you and to give you a chance to wonder. Um, and so that's that's the ocarina. Um, lastly, uh, as part of the Stanford VR Design Lab, uh, we are trying to really ask the question, what kinds of new experiences can we create in something like virtual reality? What new instruments, how do we make music together? And this idea of audiovisual interaction and kind of these social dimensions really are coming, have to come together for us to try to create interest experiences that not only allow us to kind of do things, but also to kind of inhabit, right, a different kind of reality, not just to do, but to be in a sense. And for this, we have tools like Chuck for Unity, and that's aforementioned Unity. So I'm just going to just play one more thing. This is from uh, from my PhD student, Kung Wu Kim, he's created a kind of an interactive musical city. All the sounds are generated by Chuck, 
It's an algorithmically generated kind of a system that's controlled by interacting with elements of the cityscape. So it begins at night, and uh, you can turn, kind of advise the algorithmic generation uh, through how you turn on, say, the lights in the buildings. There's a tight audiovisual correspondence, as you see in here. And uh, the Ferris wheel controls tempo. There are planes, there are automobiles. They all become part of this musical world. And when things really get going, we're going to go to the moon. And on the moon, there are rabbits. And of course, they're making rice cake. And from their concoction comes a core train that's actually done using granular synthesis with a chuck. And this train is just finding its way through the city. UFOs are going to come out of the sky. They're not here to hurt anybody. They're here just to, you know, play music together in a kind of a marimba band made out of UFOs. At the end of the night, uh, everything peaceful turns off and uh, we're ready for the next day. So that's Kung Wu's uh, Midi Dot City. And so uh, this is. In a nutshell, in Chuck, there's a lot more. There's, a, there's also a community uh, here, and I'm so glad to see the community becoming kind of like um, a Venn diagram that intersects here, right? And um, so there's Chuck, there's Tunity, there's Chuck on mobile devices, there's actually Web Chuck, um, and of course, um, there's now Chuck Designer, um, and also Falk. So with this, uh, Isabel and David, I'll uh, send things back to you. Amazing. That was so fabulous. Okay, I'm I'm ready. I, am I broadcasting? You are cute. Yep. You're okay, back. Great. So back online. So here I have opened up the Chuck Designer project on my computer, and this is the experimental version on Windows. And this is the project, and I can from this drop-down menu I can select any kind of preset of Chuck code. So I can, for instance, pick the synthesis toolkit mandolin, and that's going to show the code on the left here. And then I can hit add Chuck code on the right. So let's listen to this. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to, I think I had paused it. So now we can hear that. I'll just reset it. So the way this is working, is that we have a Chuck Audio custom operator, and we can uh, pipe audio into it. This is just stereo audio going into it, and we can make an effect. And if we uh, select the number of input channels to two, then it can read from its input, and it can also have a number of output channels. But the way that the way that this specific code has been written is that it has two output channels, and so that's why if I were to hit add Chuck code, then the output would be stereo. Now I'm going to jump to a cooler example, which is a drum sequencer. So from uh, uh, from a tip from Ga or from Greg about uh, using the multi-level from the palette, you can find this uh, in the tools, and then uh, multi-level tools multi-level. I'll, I'll just drag another one in. So this is the multi-level uh, component. So I'll open this, and now I'll go over to my Chuck audio operator, which is set to zero input channels and two output channels with an audio rate of forty-four thousand one hundred. And uh, notice that there is a global float value of BPM. So that's 120 beats per minute. And this global null global float is on the global float parameter of the Chuck audio chop. So uh, I'll, I'm not going to cover the code, but if I hit uh, add Chuck code on this, it's going to add it to the Chuck virtual machine and start executing. So let's listen. And what's happening now is there's no audio because we don't have any notes present. And uh, before I cover, uh, well, just to satisfy everyone a little bit, so there, that's, that should be a note that you should hear. And the 
Uh, the height of the value has been programmed so that it controls the velocity. So if I do a higher value, it should be louder. So we can code a little rhythm here, maybe some syncopation, and I'll turn it off. And over here, we have a Chuck listener. And so the Chuck listener corresponds to the Chuck audio. So we take our Chuck audio and we drag it onto the Chuck instance custom parameter of the Chuck listener. We can uh, define any number of callback variables here. So we have playhead position, and that is because the playhead position is a global variable inside the Chuck code. And that uh, playhead position is also going to show up in the Python callback. So there's a get float Python callback, and in that function, we could print out get float, the name of the variable and the value of that variable. But we're actually using it to be a uh, streamed out chop, uh, chop value. So this is the playhead position that's being calculated by Chuck. And that playhead position is what's moving this red bar. So that is uh, the, the, the drum sequencer. Uh, yeah, for, a, for, for some, sorry, uh, for some reason we're not hearing the sound. We did for, su for a moment before, but uh, it, it disappeared. Hmm. Okay, well, I know, I, I think I turned it off. Let's, let's, let's hear again. Do you hear any of these? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. Faintly now, yeah, faintly now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, there that, they are. That's, the, uh, that's that drum sequencer. And now we have a more complex drum sequencer over here. So I'm going to open up this. And this is multi-track. So I'm going to hit add chuck code. And now this is running. And now I can put down some hi-hats. And I can also put different... And the way that this is working is... David, uh, you're kind of cutting in and out. Okay. Not, it's not critical, but... In terms of volume or... Uh, your your maybe, voice here and there. Maybe hmm. a noise reduction thing? Uh oh No, I don't, I don't think I have that as any kind of setting. No, no, you're okay now. Okay. Maybe it's while sounds playing or something. I don't oh, know. Oh, you know, okay. that, was, uh, that one had the wrong setting for the device output. Okay. Let's try that one. Do you, okay. do you hear that better? Oh, yeah. And what's happening here is the Chuck code has been written so that there are extra variables to fetch out via Python callback. And these correspond to the loudness of an, of an ADSR envelope of, the, of each instrument track. And so then those values are being exported onto the UI. And that is controlling the brightness of, of the color background. And what's nice about Touch Designer is that I can modify this, this uh, container to be any size, any height, and I could also dive into any of these components and customize them to uh, achieve a certain UI effect. So I'll jump back into the slides. So I covered the Chuck Audio Chop and the Chuck Audio, the, the Chuck Listener Chop, and it takes any, uh, it, it takes a chop with any number of channels and samples and can also output any number of channels and samples. And an idea that I wanted to cover is uh, reuse reusability of Chuck code. So over here on the right, we have a base with a custom parameter for code, and that's a string menu. And we can just uh, select it, and then we have a, a drop-down list of Chuck code. And that is being found from the file system because I have files saved with a CK extension. So if you were to open the uh, Chuck Designer project and explore how this works, there's a, uh, co a code selector base here, and I can, uh, I can do a customized component, and you'll see this expression, uh, dat menu module and var chuck codes. And the reason that this is working is essentially because inside the base, there's this file called dat menu, and also there over here in the top left, we have a local variable. Uh, that's a, this is a global variable within Touch Designer called chuck codes, and it re refers to a specific dat. So that's, that's all I'll cover about that for now. But I would encourage you to uh, open up the project and see if, if that uh, trick might uh, help your workflow. So back to uh, the slides. Uh, that was the idea for reusability of Chuck code. And the next idea is using Chuck for MIDI. So I covered uh, using the Chuck Audio Chop to output audio rate information, say 44,000 hertz. But what if you want to output just 60 frames per second information? You can do that because I've demonstrated it on the right that you can just change the sample rate to 60. 
and uh, the the you can see the output here is not audio rate; it's actually just 60 frames per second. So we can use Chuck code to uh, output 16 channels, and those 16 channels will just correspond to whether a note is on or off, basically the the velocity of that note. And then you can use that to drive some other effect. So that can uh, drive the audio VST chop and the new experimental build, or it can drive a Faust uh, audio chop to to play a polyphonic instrument. And that that example is also covered in Chuck Designer dot the, the the demo project right now. So I'll pause here before jumping into Faust and try to answer uh, some questions from the chat about uh, Chuck before moving on to Faust. And there was a question from from Stefan about the uh, compiler of of Chuck. Uh, whether it could benefit from a just-in-time compiler, which would be similar to Faust. Stefan, by the way, is a core developer of Faust and knows all of the intricacies of the Faust compiler. So I think that he would have a, a good discussion with uh, about the, the compiler. So it might be too technical uh, for uh, answering right now. But yeah, Gaw, Gaw could could jump in later on, on that. Are there any, any other questions about Chuck? I do have a question. One of the buttons yeah. actually, it's not, it's on your implementation there. It says uh, add, add code or, or yes. add check. Is this, um, it almost sounds like I could hit this multiple times and it would then execute um, in parallel? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, in, this, in this Chuck Designer project again, if we go to this base, there's a synchronized audio example. So in here, uh, we have our, this is our, our basic Chuck code. I'm going to try to make it look pretty big. So we have uh, something that is, uh, we have an array of notes called high, integer high, and we have a loop in which we are uh, going through those notes. So uh, this Chuck thing is going to uh, launch a shred, a thread of that code. And we can launch uh, multiple shreds on the same Chuck audio chop. So I can open this, and I'm going to change the octave of the note to uh, zero, and we're just merging these two things together. So this is uh, the combined, the merged code that will be evaluated. So I will uh, go over here, change my audio out, just the volume just a little bit. So if I uh, if I add Chuck code, now I'm going to get one shred of this of this audio. And I can also, I, sorry, I need to cancel the other drum sequencers. So I'll reset that. Okay, we're, and now back to the synchronized audio example. So now we have uh, one shred that has been launched. But now I can go to this variable again, change it to a different octave. And now I can hit add chuck code. So it's going to add another shred. So now we have actually two shreds of, of that audio. Uh, being run on the same Chuck chop. Place is going to reset and add a single Chuck, uh, Chuck shred, but add Chuck code is going to keep adding uh, shreds. And so you can keep adding as many shreds as you want until your uh, computer complains. So oh, that is, so that is that, that, so that can be done all in one uh, Chuck audio node. You can, you can launch several uh, shreds at, at the same time. Yes. Ah, cool. And and that parallels um, the mini article. So I just opened up the mini article, and this is what uh, Gull was using to program earlier, where he was saying this is a sine oscillator and it's going into the DAC, for for instance. And when you start the virtual machine, then you can hit the add shred button and the replace shred button and the remove shred button, mm -hmm. and that that's how you interact with uh, adding and deleting shreds. And so right now in Chuck Designer, we're kind of missing the uh, remove shred feature to to knock out an individual shred, but I will uh, plan on adding that feature in the future. Mm. But so the the mini article is is a good um, sandbox for doing prototyping as well as uh, the uh, uh, Chuck Designer inside Touch Designer. But it might be a good idea to uh, to write your text files outside of uh, outside of Chuck because if for instance, you were to do something bad, if you were to do while true, you know, obviously in Python, if you were to do while true pass, and it would just be a for loop that never finishes, your system would crash. So if I were to run this code while true, that will cause 
uh, chuck to hang and and to calculate forever, and so that'll just freeze touch designer. So, mm. you know, if, if you write bad code, just like if you write bad Python code, it can cause uh, chaos and and cause mm -hmm. it to hang. So so it's better to uh, write your write your code outside. Um, outside of tech stats, maybe keep it on on the file system and and see how it goes. Yeah, so it's interesting that the Chuck engine just generates the like the seven hundred thirty five samples that that Touch needs to send to to uh, the audio outs or whatever uh, to keep in sync with a sixty frame per second uh, Touch engine running or Touch designer running. So this kind of happens magically behind the scenes that uh, you know. Yeah, so assuming I'm not making a typo right now, this is some valid uh, Chuck code. Mm. And I'm going to go into uh, the, I'm going to make a Chuck audio thing. We're going to make a text stat. Put it on, put it on. Number of channels uh, zero, out channels two, and now I'll just hit add Chuck code. And now we actually have a stereo. I'll cancel this thing. Now we have a stereo. Uh, a stereo sine wave, mm -hmm. and as you said, it's it's 735 samples because of our video frame rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So it just delivers what it needs uh, uh, to keep up with the uh, touch designer timeline kind of thing. Yeah, and also I could change that to one millisecond and uh, replace Chuck code, and we get the same result. Yeah, right. Exactly the same. Right, right, because it's going wild through to uh, so so right. It's it's. Um, like uh, seven times through that, a millisecond. No, um, how many milliseconds is uh, like a frame is 16.7. 16, yeah, yeah, 16.6 uh, milliseconds. So it's going to do that 16 times, 16 times, 17 times, and there's leftover for the next frame, kind of thing. Yeah. Great. Did you find it difficult to like interface be between Chuck and like? Touch Designer's time slicing model to be able to fill yeah. in those samples and keep the extras? Well, no, it was very straightforward because the developers of Chuck, including Ga and the PhD students here, they, they've made header files a kind of interface for interacting with Chuck to make it very easy. And so that's why you know, Chuck has been deployed to the iOS and to, to Tunity. It's all because of, it's a C++ project, essentially, that is easy to compile for other platforms such as Touch Designer. So mm -hmm. I give them credit for making a very clean uh, API interface. Cool. And if, I, if, I can, oh, if I could chime in, I just want to echo that to all the, all the people that have made Chuck kind of like a really clean to embed library. And I imagine like there's basically like a callback function, which is Chuck as a kind of a component is really, I imagine David, you probably did something like, there's a function basically run for number of samples in a yes. virtual machine. Right, and you you can ask for like seven hundred. How many how many samples is that per video frame? Seven hundred thirty-five. So you could actually just ask for seven hundred thirty-five samples if you wanted to, or you can break it up into however you want, and Chuck will just will 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 faithfully give you that sample. And the samples are actually what how Chuck is actually keeping track of time. So when he changed hundred milliseconds to one millisecond, it it changes how rap how fast internally Chuck is running that code, but mm -hmm. it does not change the output, of course, right. of audio uh, in that case because there's no control exerted at that rate. So yeah, I just wanted to. Great, that's super cool. <laughs> Gee. Hey, okay, uh, hey, David, can you show uh, where you use the new C++ callback Python mechanism? Um, did he use it here or? Uh... Yeah, um, so. To go back to that, so in the drum sequencer, do you want to see like the source code of that? Well, yeah, you know, well, kind of what like the an, calls are, the, the calls are that you 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 built. So the example, so yeah, there's an example here, and uh, and so yeah, so those callbacks were all um, made, well, defined by you in the C++ code. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Right, and then and the here. That was it, that was very straightforward. Yeah. So are these kind of a very typical set, the get float, get in, get string, and all that kind of thing that you would use over and over again? Yeah, definitely. Oh, and okay. and th these functions right. are going to be evaluated every video frame. Right, every video frame. All right. Okay. And I and lastly, it was it was easy, you know, C has its own variable types, floats and doubles, but you just need to cast those into the Python equivalent and then hand it mm -hmm. over to these callback methods. It's very straightforward. And 
anyone can check out my code and can copy uh, snippets of it for that purpose. Nice. Okay. David, while we're still with Chuck, there's a question from Brandon. Uh, yeah, Braden. Yeah, you got it, Braden. Yes. You got it? Yeah, I see that question. Uh, the question is, what are the possibilities with spatial audio using TD and Chuck? So I would recommend using uh, the Faust side for spatial audio because there is a something known as higher order ambisonics, HOA, library built in with the Faust libraries. And so I'm exploring that right now using uh, or generating ambisonics data, like nine channels or 16 channels of ambisonics information to output to some uh, ambisonics immersive audio system. So that's that's one purpose. Another question was about the audio VST chop, and I, I didn't have any role in the audio VST chop. Yeah, so uh, maybe we should move over to Faust. That's good. That's a good segue because I, I mentioned that Faust, I, I use that for ambisonics. So uh, Faust is uh, a, a great programming language started around the same time as Chuck in the early 2000s. And a core feature is the, the colon operator that connects to uh, or more signals as they're known. So that's why it's used in the logo here. What is Faust? Faust is the functional audio stream. Uh, it's a functional programming language for sound synthesis and audio processing. And whereas CS C++ is difficult and prone to errors and bugs, Faust code can be visually inspected as a block diagram. And this is a, an example of a block diagram. And I assure you that having the block diagram, although it looks complicated, is better than not having the block diagram. So if you're writing C++ code, you should be grateful for the opportunity to uh, visualize it in something like this. Uh, and this image comes from the Faust IDE. That's uh, faustide.grame.fr uh, because it's a it's a French research in institute that develops uh, Faust. And Stefan Lutz from the comments today, uh, he's, he's a core member of that team too. So thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, so this is the Faust IDE. Uh, this is just a screenshot of it. And at the top, I've written my Faust code. And you can see that I've imported the standard library. And that's what allows me to do something like uh, fi, that's accessing the filter library of, of Faust, dot low pass. Uh, and so uh, that low pass function is going to take two arguments, a two for the order of the filter. That's basically going to control the, uh, the, fall, the fall off or the DB roll off, uh, the sharpness of the filter cutoff. And the second argument is the cutoff. And what is the cutoff? It's defined in the line above. It's H slider and it's a cutoff. And so that is the user interface for uh, controlling the slider, just a horizontal slider. And we set a default value of 15,000, a minimum value of 30, uh, a high value of 30,000, and a step size of zero. Uh, you, can, you can clamp the step size so that it only uh, changes in increments of some number, such as 10. And it's critically going into a smooth function. And this is very important for Touch Designer because your control parameters, your values, might be changing at just 60 frames per second. But you're using that to interact with uh, something that is audio rate information. So that discrepancy can cause glitches. Uh, not glitches, but audio undesirable audio uh, artifacts. So I'll, I'll cover that uh, a little bit more in detail. But back to the Faust IDE. We've, uh, we've written our code at the top, and uh, we automatically for free get this diagram at the bottom. And so because we have our, our filter variable here, it's actually a function though, uh, we see that the filter is used uh, twice to process the left channel and right channel. And on the top right, we have the MIDI input. Uh, we have a keyboard interface. We have the audio file. You can drag and drop uh, an audio file onto here. So right now it's a mono audio file, but we could drag and drop and make it a stereo file. We can loop it with the loop button. We can change the volume. This vis this is going to visualize the output of Faust using a wave waveform view, and then we have a spectrogram view of the output of Faust. Mm -hmm. And on the left we have uh, a run button and an export button and uh, information on. Uh, the number of polyphonic voices and some other settings. So if in this diagram view, if you were to click on the filter, then you're going to uh, dive into the inside of that diagram. So that's going to look like this, because inside the filter, we have a low pass, this fi filter dot low pass function. And uh, if we dive in again on that, this is going to be the guts of a kind of uh, one or two pole low pass filter. 
Um, but this is, uh, you know, a, kind of a, a step beyond what what most Faust users might have to think about, because you'll just be calling the uh, FI filter, and you're going to you're going to be making diagrams using it. You're only going to be interacting with the filter at this kind of of a level, and you may not need to go to the lower level. Hmm. But the diagram helps you debug all of that information. And uh, last, uh, there's this cutoff uh, uh, function that we've defined. And so cutoff uh, has this min over here on the left and also has the maximum on the right. So this is the H, sli the, the H slider that's going to control the cutoff of our low pass filter. And if we hit the export thing on the left, then we're going to get all of these drop-down menus for the different platforms that the fast code can be exported to, such as C++ or Teensy or Juice. And this is just an example of a more complicated uh, Faust code because we're doing a polyphonic synthesizer. So we define the, the standard polyphonic variables, which kind of come for free for interacting with the MIDI keyboard. So those are frequency, gain, and gate. And if you name them exactly these things that are in the orange orangish color, then when you turn on computer keyboard and do ASDF, you're going to get uh, a C major scale on your keyboard. So that's a great way to uh, make polyphonic instruments in Faust. And these are the Faust libraries. So go to this URL, explore it, and, and read about all of the things that come, come built in uh, with Faust, such as uh, great envelopes, you know, ADSR curves, for example, uh, this uh, spatial library, yeah. information on uh, reverbs, flangers, oscillators, echoes, uh, uh, wave digital, uh, uh, wave digital, uh, guide synthesis, physical modeling, so really great libraries all, all built in. And this is an example that I coded uh, based on some other code that I found through browsing uh, Git, GitHub. Uh, so this is going to do a filter bank. So uh, a common trick in, in uh, DSP is to take a signal and split it into two different uh, sections. And so actually, if you have you know, a bookcase, a nice bookshelf speaker, it's gonna have a woofer and it's gonna have a tweeter. And so you are sending it one signal, but that signal actually needs to be split into two different sections for each speaker to work independently. So the, the big speaker, the big cone, is not trying to play the high frequency information. Actually built into those uh, speakers is some, some DSP that is uh, breaking it into the two signals so that each speaker can be uh, purposely built for uh, uh, playing back a different kind of frequency range. So that's that's what a filter bank is. But in this example, we have the left channel and the right channel, uh, each going into its own filter bank. And each filter bank is going to output a, a low, mid, and, free, and, and high frequency. And so we're doing that for both the left and right channel. And I've just written the code so that the left the, the lows of the first filter bank and the lows of the second filter bank merge over here. So we got a low, we get the lows of the left and the right, we get the mids of the left and, and the right, and the highs of the left and right. So this is six output channels. So if we go back to what that looks like in uh, in Touch Designer, we're going to have our, our Faust component, and this is in the TD Faust demo, and we have our code DSP filter bank, and we'll hit compile on the the Faust comp, and the uh, we'll hit setup UI on the Faust comp. And what setup UI is going to do is we define these variables crossover one and crossover two. And so those are the frequencies at which the filter bank is going to split. So now let's look at how it looks in Touch Designer. So we have a stereo signal going into our filter bank. We have the code here on the left dragged onto the Faust comp. And when we hit setup UI, we hit compile and then we hit setup UI. And then there's going to be the control uh, panel of the Faust comp. So that's where our custom UI is going to be set up. We're going to see X01 and X02 because that's what we defined in our Faust code. It's going to output six channels, and uh, they're just they're just named one through six. So if I select channels one through two, these are the the uh, the left and the right um, low frequencies, and then the mids and the highs. And you can see that very nicely. This is obviously uh, a low frequency information. You can see a big uh, wavelength, and over here you can see the high frequency. So this is a, a great and efficient way to segment your audio into different frequency ranges, and then you can do some kind of analysis. Uh, any any questions about that right now? So that's that's just using Faust inside Touch Designer. That's great. So like, you, um, 
doing a filter bank like that in touch design, it would be like many, many, many nodes that are kind of like taking up lots of uh, resources. So having it all built into one thing, one one entity, one one Faust node is 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 super efficient, and gives you a lot more control. Yeah, I'd say that also it's it's really a small order of magnitude. Like we're talking about the difference between 0.2 milliseconds versus 0.1 milliseconds. That's really the savings that we're getting from doing it this way. Mm -hmm. But it's also interesting and, and just useful on a theoretical level because you are perfectly segmenting your region into the different bands. And so if I if right. I jump back into this thing, we have the lows and the mids and the highs. So I've, I've actually tested this. So if you take a math chop and you merge the, if you add those signals back together and then compare to the to the very beginning input sequence, you'll actually hear a very similar thing. And that's that's kind of the intention of how a, a bookshelf speaker would work. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. <clears throat> yep. So uh, what's the the question is what's the best TD Faust workflow? And I would actually recommend using the IDE because when you're using the IDE. You're going to get uh, the the best. Uh, you're going to get these block diagrams uh, computed for you at the bottom, and it's going to tell you your compile errors very nicely. Uh, it's also going to have the best auto completion and documentation, which is just a an internet search engine search away. It's going to have uh, keyboard uh, support, so you can go AD, at ASDF and get a C major scale. And it also has features that TD Faust has uh, inside Touch Designer, and those are things like looping audio or playing back custom audio or using microphone input or MIDI support from MIDI hardware. But I'd say that the advantages of, of using, of actually abandoning the IDE and using Touch Designer is that you can use Setup UI to make your own UI, and you can use chops to drive control parameters. So if you can have generative kind of automation of parameters over time, so that's very interesting. And you can also, of course, use it with any kind of uh, uh, HCI or uh, hardware interface like a, a depth camera or any kind of wacky interaction you come up with. Mm. So that's that's uh, my suggestion about um, the TD Faust workflow. You might be able to and, use um, um, the web render comp in combination with maybe a web client to fetch the fetch the code in the end. I'm not sure if that would be Well Yeah, no, I think I think that the the Every, everything about the Faust backend is just programmed so expertly and professionally. So the idea of, say, making an SVG uh, integration where you can actually have the block diagram computed inside DD Faust is actually feasible. It could be more work than I'm asking to do <laughs> right now for myself, but it, it's totally possible because because Faust is is uh, is such a good library for this. And uh, so. The, 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 the TD Faust project has a Faust comp, but if you dive into that uh, Faust comp, that's where you'll, you'll actually found, find the Faust chop. So the Faust chop is the custom operator, and it has uh, three inputs. The first input is the audio rate input. So it's, a, for example, a vocal signal on which you'd like to apply reverb. And the second input is the control input. So the user interface slider to control uh, the amount of feedback in an echo, or in that demo that I showed earlier, there was a cutoff custom parameter. So you might want to connect a, a chop with a, a given, a specific ch uh, channel name, something like my instrument slash cutoff, and that's going to be able to control the cutoff of, of the compiled fast code. And the third input is a, a MIDI buffer. So this has to be a chop with 128 channels, where each channel corresponds to a note. So uh, that can be useful for uh, playback of a, of a MIDI file, for example. Um, also on the right, we have the custom parameters of the Faust. And so, uh, for example, we have Faust libraries path, my Faust library. So that's where if you wanted to make your own library of Faust code, you could have my Faust library dot lib, and you can put functions inside that fun that library. And then you can say import my Faust library lib, and then you will be able to call functions uh, from that library. The assets path, that's where you can find assets. So you, if you want to play back a WAV file, then you'll be able to do that if you put them in that folder. And so the, the demo project uh, highlights all of this. And next, I want to give a short lesson on control rate, which is what I was hinting at earlier. So let's compare these two examples. In the first example, we're going to make uh, a UI for our volume slider, and we're going to modify the volume of a 
a sine oscillator set at 440 hertz, and it's just being split into stereo channel. And crucially, this volume slider is only going to be updated from Touch Designer to Faust uh, once every video frame, so say 60 frames per second. But let's compare that to a different example in which we take our, vo our same volume user interface, but we smooth it with a, something known as a, a, a one-pull filter with a short uh, uh, kind of uh, decay time, uh, a 60th of, of a second. So we're going to instead take that smoothed volume and multiply it by our sine oscillator. And that is going to basically very efficiently smooth out uh, whatever the user is doing by interacting with the slider such that the audio is less artifacty. So visually, in Touch Designer, that's going to look like this. We have an audio oscillator that might be, uh, it might be the user that's some, something that's like 60 frames per second, or it might be some signal that's only 100 or two, 400 hertz. And that's being routed into the second input of the Faust chop to control the user interface. And on the top example, we have the unsmoothed example. So the output, this is a trail that's only, say, 0.1 or 0.2 seconds long. And it's, it's highlighting how there's this uh, steppiness where the volume suddenly gets lou uh, louder and the volume suddenly gets softer. And that's because our, vol our volume input is only being sampled 60 frames per second. But on the bottom example, we have Faust smoothing our control parameter for us. So again, uh, that volume is going to si.smooth, and that's going to uh, smooth it out. And so we see a, a nicer uh, shape, curvier shape to the trail. And so oftentimes, this is going to be more pleasant to listen to than the steppier example at the top. So when you're developing uh, your custom operators or your, your custom Faust code, it's generally a good idea to uh, put a, a smooth function after a, a user interface, but sometimes it may be unnecessary because you might actually be streaming in information that is audio rate, and so it would be redundant to smooth it, for example. So I hope that that covers uh, the, uh, the audio, the, the control rate information. Are there any questions on this? Okay, I think Not I'll in the chat, yeah. keep, keep moving on. So uh, next question is, can I use Faust inside Chuck, inside Touch Designer? And the answer is yes, because Roman Michon and Gaolang made Falk, uh, which is a Chug file known as a Chugin, .chug. And you can find uh, a repository of Chugins on GitHub. And you can also find this URL to learn more about Falk. And Falk is actually working inside uh, inside Chuck Designer right now, inside Touch Designer, but installation is still a little bit tricky, so I, I won't give you inst full instructions for it yet, but the premise is that if you have a working directory, my audio assets, inside that directory, you should make a, fo a folder called Chuggins, capital Chuggins, and in that folder, you would have anything blah, 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 dot Chug, and then those uh, Chuggins can be referenced inside the Chuck code that you write inside Chuck Designer. So what that's going to look like is this is this is a demonstration of Falk. So we're going to have our ADC audio to a digital converter. So that might take whatever information is going into the Chuck audio chop, and that's going to go to a Faust reverb. Faust is the name of our Chuck again, and that's going to the to the DAC. Next, we're going to take the Faust Chug in, and we're going to say evaluate this code. And this is uh, this is a one liner of Faust code with a nice uh, back backslash uh, backslash apostrophe uh, with uh, inside process equals a DM for demo Zeta light. And that is a, a demo reverb. Next, we will print out information about the Faust code. So we're going to say reverb.dump. And so if you were in Touch Designer to go to the dialogues window and select console, then in that console window, you're going to get a printout of information about what the variable names are within uh, it within the Faust code that you've, you've compiled. So that when you uh, send commands back to, to, uh, to the Faust chugin, they're going to be titled correctly. So in this while true loop, uh, we, are, we are taking our, our chugin and we're, set, we're calling dot V value and we're uh, giving it the name of the variable. And so this variable name, zeta light dry wet mix, that's, that's going to be printed out to us uh, by reverb.dump so we know what value to set. And then we're going to set the Faust reverb mix 
uh, the, the dry-wet mix of that reverb uh, using uh, a global variable. And so that global variable fast reverb mix can be set by uh, Chuck Designer via Python. So you'd call op Chuck Audio Chop uh, and then dot set float and you'd give it the name and then you'd, you'd give it the value. So chugins are really great. I think that if you are a C++ developer, it might even be easier to uh, set up a, 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 a chugin uh, in, a, in a quick way to uh, make a, a, a custom operator that does uh, audio, and then you'll just load that in as a, as a dot chug file. And those chugin files will also work with mini article, the, the standard uh, chuck IDE. Uh, some loose ends about both of these topics are that uh, both Faust and Chuck don't have guardrails. So you definitely want to listen at a low volume or be prepared to rip out your headphones slash kill the volume. And you want to keep parameters within reasonable ranges. For example, that means if you have a low pass filter, don't set it to something above the Nyquist frequency. So for, for example, the audio rate might be 44,000 and the Nyquist frequency is half of that, 22, roughly 22,000. So you don't want to set the low pass filter to be say 25,000 because uh, the way uh, audio effects work or some filters work is that they, uh, they make calculations based on the previous output. And so because of that recursion, things can blow up. And so a lot of audio libraries will um, make precautions and prevent you from doing the wrong thing. For example, setting the low pass filter cutoff to something too high, but you are responsible for making sure that you don't uh, introduce feedback by making a circuit that is kind of unstable due to its recursion. Uh, next, Chuck can cause Touch Designer to hang if you code badly, for example, an empty while true loop. So it, it would be a good idea to develop your, your code inside uh, just plain text files. Next question is, can I use these plugins with Touch Engine? I think so. I haven't done much of that myself, but I, I have a, a good inclination that they might uh, work with uh, Touch Engine. And does this relate to what I'm doing with machine learning? The answer is yes. Uh, I'm using uh, I'm, I'm developing another Python library called DawDreamer, which you can install with just pip install DawDreamer. That is a Python module for rendering audio offline with Faust, VSTs, and other audio processors. For example, you might want to uh, design a sound. You might want to have a VST plugin, and you want to export one shots of that VST plugin on all of the different uh, pitch, uh, pitches. So you want a C and a C sharp and so on of, of all the different sounds, you can use this Python library to interact with that, that VST, save out all of the audio files, and then you can use those files within Faust and Chuck inside Touch Designer. And so that, that can be an, inter an interesting workflow and uh, a, a way to optimize your system because you won't be using a VST to compute something on the fly. Instead, you're using a VST, uh, you, you've, you've pre-computed the output of that VST, saved it to a WAV file, and then you're simply playing back the WAV file. So that's the optimization with, with Daw Dreamer. And my intention is also to use machine learning to find great presets for audio plugins or to recreate an instrument in a given audio track. And tips on getting started with all these projects, Faust and Chuck. Uh, please browse the repositories and star them to get updates on new releases. So if you star the repo, whenever I uh, push a, a release, it's going to be a numbered release like 0 0.3. Uh, that's going to have bug fixes or new features, and you're going to get a notification in your kind of GitHub timeline that uh, that some feature has been pushed. So uh, please consider doing that. The Chuck Designer branch right now, because Touch Designer is on an experimental build, uh, and it's not the these new features of the Python interface are not in the official build yet. I'm still maintaining Chuck Designer on this uh, this special branch, the, the Python a API branch. But once the experimental build becomes an official build, I will consider merging that back into the uh, the main branch of the Chuck Designer project. For learning Faust, uh, please follow the Faust manual at the top of this URL. That's this is a, a, my number one getting started point for learning Faust and in combination with using the Faust IDE. And also from this URL, you're, you're gonna find a section called the syntax of Faust. And this is a, a very concise and, and good way of learning the Faust uh, syntax. And I refer to it every time I'm coding Faust to, uh, to practice examples of, of some of the built-in operators. Mm. Next, I would recommend uh, reading the book, Programming for Musician, Musicians and Digital Artists, Creating Music with Chuck. And that was by Gawang and many other core contributors to the Chuck language. And so that book is 
I think 100% about using Chuck, and it's it's the definitive text of of great ideas on on using Chuck for different. It's it's it'll just introduce you to all of the different ways of thinking about Chuck, and also his book uh, Artful Design, and there are listservs and discords for these communities, so you can consider joining those as well. And I think that is all. Try to answer some questions. Laser David, wow. Um, there's more um, exclamations of happiness, not questions. <laughs> I think the questions right. are being formulated. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might just want to uh, point out again, all of this can be found on your GitHub. So yes. if people are looking for this, uh, they just have to look for uh, Deep Brown on GitHub to find all of that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there um, any thoughts you have of maybe simplifying it, things in any way for a kind of like non-programming or non-GitHub type users, i.e. Um, like me? <laughs> uh, yeah, like in, in, in embedding things more or st stuff like that or, or making it s easier to s snag all the libraries into one place without thinking about where they are and stuff like that. Well, I think that that would involve like a kind of .exe installer, which is what Touch Designer does, like, you know, that kind of thing to install something to your system. Yeah. But I think in the short term, I still need to just rely on saying, uh, download this zip folder, unzip it, and copy these few things to these few locations. And that's that's the procedure right now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's terrible. Uh, yeah. It could be better, but no. I might have to stick that stick to that for a while. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Hey, I have a question for Gav, um, which is, just wondering what you're um, what you're thinking about these days or working on, and if there's anything in technology that is sort of newly interesting to you, in technology oh. or otherwise, just generally speaking. Well, th thanks for th yeah, thanks thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, it, well, it's, it seems like there's so much that's new and terrifying, honestly, <laughs> and uh, so. Currently, um, yeah, we've really been ramping up on the VR design lab side of things. Um, and with the questions of like, you know, kind of really, I mean, to be honest, like, you know, the, for anyone who's, who's read like, you know, enough cyberpunk or, you know, Snow Crash, the metaverse is not like necessarily the nicest place to, 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 to coming from this website we think oh, is there sound uh, maybe no, uh, no the website doesn't 
So My sound everybody, is clean. Did anyone hear? I guess nobody heard what Go had to say. So. Yeah, Okay, maybe, maybe, uh, but, but we, but I think they missed everything that Go had to say. Maybe I'll, I can I can uh, quickly re yeah. rephrase. Yes, um, you're talking about what you, what you're thinking about and working on, and what's sort of important to you these days. Right. So, and thanks again, Isabel, for the question. Um, you know, I think, you know, like David, I think we're, you know, there's for me, like maybe before anything else, like I'm a tool builder, but I think being a responsible tool builder, or at least trying to be means we have to not only build the tools, but really try to think through as best we can through the implications. And so one of the things we're working on heavily right now is VR and VR design, designing tools, designing instruments, designing social interactions for creative expression within VR. We have programming languages that are in situ, which means you're actually in VR, actually doing programming. We have like a Chuck actually in VR, uh, but also thinking about kind of like these questions of like doing. What are things you want to do in in VR versus how you want to be in VR? And we think a lot of times we focus a lot on doing at the expense of being. And I feel like that's like a that's that's a deficit. And and I think you know so so a lot of it's engineering. But I think good engineering must try to take account the humanities and, and the humanistic angle. So for us, it's it is trying to trying to envision like a future where it's not like the actual like metaverse from like you know snow crash or like from from any number any cyberpunk kind of genre where it's i don't know why big tech keeps naming like technology after dystopic things like mm -hmm. there's there's the metaverse right uh palantir is like that just for a surveillance company that is also like in canvas which is our learning management system there's actually the place you watch video is this thing called Panopto. I don't know who made that. I don't know who, like, but I'm just like, that's like the worst name ever for a technology company that does video. Cause you know, I mean, this this is the pan, like it reminds us of the Panopticon, which is a prison where like basically all the prisoners have no privacy and it's because it's in a circle. Anyway, I'm just like, so for us, I think part of the research is really through the things we build, figure out like, how do we want to live with our technology in ways that's actually human? So in addition to the VR, there is the laptop orchestra. We'll be back after two years of hiatus due to COVID. Um, and hopefully this spring, we will be back online for the first time in three years and we'll continue to make new instruments there. And finally, um, I am working more on kind of like thinking about kind of human humanistic ways of thinking about building AI systems. Um, and so, like, it's it's a kind of what I'll call a kind of a tight human the loop kind of way to think about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And really, what that research is about is it's all centered around building tools. But then I think the question is, you know, what's the right balance between automation versus kind of human meaningful human interaction? So it's like HCI plus AI plus the humanities. So anyway, so those are just some of the the the. The kind of areas and something like Chuck um, is continually. Uh, it's we've been working on this thing for like 20 years now, uh, you know, much like Touch Diner and Faust. So the community keeps growing, and we are we're really like very fired up to keep on, you know, working on the language. And I'm writing some. I'm writing two more books. Um, one of them is on my grandmother, wow. <laughs> who is 102 years old this wow. year. Fantastic. So, yeah. What what's What's her secret, or do we have time for that? Um, you know, I she's so chill. Uh, you know, um, having seen she was born in the same year the Treaty of Versailles was signed. Like that was uh, wow, 1919. So I'm still trying to figure out her secret. She might be still trying to figure out her secret, but um, maybe she's got one, or maybe she doesn't. Maybe that's the secret. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, Marcus, do we have Go's course? Because it's uh. Something other people, a lot of people might be interested in. Ah, oh, did I? Okay, you know what? We, we, we'll get back to. Oh. I have this one here, the Karma website. Actually, if you, uh, Marcus, if you go back, if you would, to the Artful Design site and click on the Teaching tab, there's a really quick way to get there. 
teach you click on teach and you click on that circle on the right the big one uh, actually no sorry go back one this is the other course i'm teaching if you click on the square <laughs> this one artful design yeah that's yep. the one yeah. triangles no triangles <laughs> ran out of shapes after uh so this is a this is a six-week um stanford continuing studies course it'll be online and it's really actually dealing with some of these questions around technology design and like culture and society. Yeah. Um, and it's really, and it uses artful design as the textbook. So it's a place to just come together and, and think together on really how yeah. designers we can, you know, can face the future in a way. <laughs> sure. I think that's a very, very important part of designing. I mean, at any point in time, but especially now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting. I was saying that we're we're being really whisked along or sucked along by kind of the corporate direction of metaverse and AI and stuff like that. And and y you say and we we said there's you have choice. I mean, you, you have tools where you can explore things on your so you can design the kind of the environments that you want and the interactions, the way to play together that you want and stuff like that. So it's not like it's not like there's no choice. It's very easy to get whisked and sucked into a, a, a certain uh, marketing effort, but uh, you know there's 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 so many options with technology that uh, do it yourself, DIY, explore yourself. I think that's so true, and I think I think the two things, both things, are true. It's so easy to get whisked away, and if but the default is to be whisked away. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. to really have any chance of an aid, of a say in our future. Yeah, we really have to fight for it. We always do. There's no, and I think, and strangely, I think something like making music, making audiovisual things, you know, creating things that are, I like to tell my students that are somewhat useless but interesting. Mm -hmm. It seems like the good, you know, that's such a good start to like, and maybe a good end to like. That's such a good way to be to kind of, maybe in a way, reclaim this agency that I think we're always losing. To yeah. Kind of the, the the currents of technology and 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 really like the businesses that are thriving because they're yeah. here money from that while not thinking as hard about what that does to you know our culture and our mm -hmm. societies and communities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. no, I'm yeah. with you. Totally with you. I think. Yeah, and this algo rave idea is uh, a good one too. Try yeah, to keep see. exploring that a little bit, oh, Heinrich. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Getting to that point, uh, everybody can practice in the IDE for now and then be ready for the algorithm when that yep. comes. <laughs> it's kind of... So, Marcus, you downloaded and tried um, um, Chuck, Chuck Designer. Yeah, I got it off the GitHub and uh, was pretty easy to install. I think because you just you don't have to jump to through many hoops. And uh, David, you're supplying a downloadable uh, zip. Um, to, to get all of that and good instructions to it as well. The example files are excellent. And then the first place I went to was literally the uh, Faust IDE um, to get, just to play around with it and um, get into this mode of changing. As I learned scripting, basically, like I just go in and change parts of it. And it's really well, it's so nice to understand this language. You don't have to, you're not, um, with Chuck as well, you're not, uh, stuck with the uh, syntax issues first. It like there's no, yeah, there's no setup necessarily. It just goes. Yeah. So it's a great way to spend your weekend, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're muted, Isabel. And um, yeah, yeah, and and to me, I, I find it amazing, David, that that you're kind of mixing two very different software architectures and it kind of hangs together. It does hang together. It means touch designer does its thing the way it does, stepping ahead 60 frames a second, more video focused than, than, than uh, uh, subsample for focused. And, but, but still it's, it's kind of transparent to the user that, uh, that, that this is underneath it all, you know, you're throwing off, uh, Bunch of threads and they're merging things together and there's all this stuff happening behind the scenes but it's it's really and it's partly related to the fact that this has been implemented with uh, other uh tools like unity that it's at that stage now where it's pretty pretty seamless 
Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, I give credit to the, the, all of the developers working on all of these tools. It's been very important. Mm. Yeah. And and touch designer, you know, time slicing. Like I don't I don't have to think about time time slicing. Touch designer says that the custom operator needs this number of samples, and then I just go to Chuck and I say, give me this number of samples, and everything <laughs> works. Yeah. Oh yeah. You were, you talked earlier about uh, super low latency. Um, um, I forget what the what the yeah it's called term. It, well it's called fast. Um, I yeah. forget what it means, but FPGA is the field programmer programmable gate array. And mm -hmm. so part of the Faust team is working on uh, compiling Faust for FPGA devices. So that would be nanosecond latency. Uh, so you could actually have some, you know, a, a hardware knob and you'd be moving that knob and through the, the magic of electromagnetism, you'd have nanosecond latency of, of affecting compilable Faust code. Wow, that's amazing. Sorry, not, maybe not nano, but microsecond, just like an insanely low mm -hmm. latency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. So David, as you're kind of uh, itemizing all the uh, facilities at Karma and knowing that your uh, your stay there is, is coming to a bit of an end, like how are you going to how are you going to deal with leaving? And do you have you thought about um, your future after that? <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, I think I'm just going to continue to pursue my interest in some in in industry or academia or something with uh, you know audio programming and and visual programming and machine learning and something that you know, is is at the Venn, Venn diagram intersection of, of all of these topics that I find interesting. Fantastic. Mm. You're pretty fortunate. Oh, and um, uh, Dave, did, did you have any kind of um, questions of us or comments or requests of us that uh, mm. came up over the last little while? You mentioned a couple of them yesterday. Oh, I, I mean, I don't, need to, <laughs> I don't need to rehash them, but uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking. Thank you for that. I don't, okay. I, yeah. Well, we did, we, we did actually, actually did ask a question back to R&D about the, one of your requests about expanding patterns. You know, yeah. Chan one six expands. So there's actually a function called TDU dot expand, which takes a, a pattern and expands it out into um, a, a list. Yes. And there's a, something also for expanding out op names. Um, it's uh, it's a par dot something dot. Anyway, there's a way to, of gen generating a list of operator names from like light star in a render top stuff like that. So there's there's uh, stuff like that, but um, anyway. Yeah, doing that in C++ would be nice. Yeah. Oh, in C++, I see, not in Python. Okay. Okay, anything else on the chat here? Yeah, I'm just looking. Wish there was more touch designer used back in 2011, 2015 when I was there. Mm. It's the main program I use for my graphics work along with Unity and Houdini. Suffix okay. from oh. Karma as well, a uh, former student from Karma. Yeah, so maybe you can um, uh, talk a bit about the kind of the kind of a history of, of uh, computer music at Stanford and, and kind of maybe even what, what kind of preceded you. Because, um, um, yeah, as a language, I mean, um, uh, Faust is is kind of similar to some of the pre predecessors way back to like the I mean the early 80s with uh, C Sound uh, Music Five uh, something I worked on called um, C Music from and and I, again uh, Moore uh, F R Moore I think had some kind of effect within uh, the uh, this the Stanford music community as well. I would love for God to take that question. Good. Did you want to take that? <laughs> I'd be happy to. Maybe we can do both do it. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll get us started. Um, so history of computer music at Stanford. Really, you know, we. It's. I think it's probably some um, fifty six years ago. I want to say when the 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 first like term karma or maybe computer music was really came into. Um, was written on a document, right? We had, a, and uh, I think it was forty years, forty some years ago, when um, 
when karma really came into into being um, as a kind of a center. But I think um, you can't really look at the history of computer music at at Stanford without without thinking about like someone like people like John Chowning, right? And, yeah. The inventor of the frequency modulation synthesis, mm -hmm. uh, and really is the you know the founding director of of Karma, uh, but also Karma kind of you know there's a time when Karma was like working out of out of the Stanford AI lab, um, doing timeshare on those computers, and so we're kind of have this like melding of different with different mm -hmm. aspects of computer science here, uh, but as you said, yeah, like is also intersects with the rich history of. Um, of computer music languages, right? Going all the way back to music five and earlier to Max Matthews music one. <laughs> no, that's two, too far goes three, back. Four, uh, music four B, music five. There's a uh, this whole class, this whole family of music and languages, which you know things like Maximus P, Super Collider, C Sound, as you mentioned. Um, I think C Music is 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 similar, but it take, took a different approach. From the using the Carl, right? If I'm not mistaken, kind of the Carl yeah. library at DCSD. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, there's a time when music languages are like named after the machines that were built with. You know, music, there's Music 360 for the IBM 360, Music wow. 10 for the PDP 10, Music 11 for the PDP 11. Um, yeah. And those are the time, you know, back in the day where you like write road code and you waited like, you know, hours, maybe sometimes days for the audio to actually render mm -hmm. and like oh that's not exactly what i wanted yeah um, that was that was kind of my experience with um computer music this is in 1982 when uh, i was working at a research institute in in toronto um for um doing research on how uh, how pilots can use uh, sound cues to um inform them versus using instruments and so my job there was to uh, take C music from UCSD and port it down to uh, PDP-11 and then get handed over to the uh, researchers. But um, but I um, but I it, which 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 had a big influence on the original concept of touch designer because it was basically a modular synthesizer at that time. Modular patchable synthesizers existed and, and then. Um, computer people wanted to say, okay, why don't we do that with computers? But you couldn't do it in real time. So you could synthesize stuff, but like um, like I was saying yesterday, um, to get eight seconds of sound, you had to go to sleep and wait for 11 hours for the thing to come up and, and hope that, that that stuff that came out. But I, I dug up, I dug up um, actually a, a, pr a printout. I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, whoops. This is uh, C Music's language, which is actually... Each row of the uh, text is a definition of an instrument with inputs and outputs. And this is going to very much like what became, became of touch design, like modules where you take inputs and outputs and uh, wire them together. And this is like one instrument. And then this is another instrument designed with a oscillator filter and stuff like that. And then a bit of a score, which plays notes. So it was divided into those parts, like instrument design and then just playing a score based on uh, no notes playing those instruments with some certain parameters sent to it. So, uh, you know, years later after that, uh, you know, we started side effects and then, uh, and then, then um, where prisms and SOPs came out as procedural node based system. And then, then over to uh, derivative and touch designer. So there is kind of like a big circle. It's not only a, a, um, uh, Turdukkin, but it's, it's also, that's it, kind of like, a, I don't know if, if you call it a, a thing inside inside a thing, it's very much of a, a web of turkeys, ducks, and chickens, and tofu. It's a web of tofurkeys and turdukkin. It's amazing how everything kind of ties together, though. Just in case people wide. don't know what that is, uh, I yeah, didn't yeah. quite know. It's a Oh. Chicken inside a duck inside a turkey? No. What? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so should it be a tox chicken? Yeah, what, what is this? Uh, what have you What have you done, David? Yeah. Yeah, it's got us thinking on uh, turkeys and ducks. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
That's sure. Okay. It's cute. But I, I, I'll emphasize that, yeah, learning the history and development of audio programming has been very interesting. Thinking about this partitioning between instruments and scores, it's mm. very cool. And Touch Designer with its whole graph-based system where you have a graph and you, and Touch Designer is benevolently, com, you know, compiling this graph for us and, and evaluating it efficiently and, and doing the cooking instructions efficiently for us. That has some parallels to how the Chuck VM works, even though I'm not an expert in the Chuck VM, but it's it's computing things dynamically, and you can even dynamically add things to the graph. It's, it's like yeah, Touch yeah. Designer. Yeah. I, I had a question. Um, has uh, has Touch Designer sort of made any uh, made it, made any forays at uh, at Stanford? Yeah, definitely. I'm talking to uh, my. The, the master's students and the PhD students within Karma, and they're all uh, learning it right now. Like, I feel oh, like, I don't want to take credit for it, but like, because oh, it, it, it's not it's not just me being here, it's just touch designer being touch designer and being mm -hmm. awesome. But uh, I feel like, yeah, it's it's it sparked something here and there's growing interest in it. So I'm, I'm really happy about that. It's mm -hmm. very exciting for us, very. You, you've been a, yeah, David has been a wonderful spokesperson. I think, <laughs> and, uh, and someone Amen. that really, really uh, I think shown just the power and and the fun of, of doing this just through his his work but also like also it's just his willingness to actually like to really like build and bring tools together I think in this constellation of turducken kind of an idea you know, kind of a theme I feel like uh yeah I, I just want to throw it out there David thank you thanks yeah yeah, ditto. I mean, you, you you have no fear in tackling new fields, new software, and re relating them together. <laughs> like, no fear. <laughs> I guess, um, you don't yeah. don't have a developer's corner today, Marcus. You Sorry? You don't have a developer's corner today, but we have not. I think, I think this was a... I thought this was a huge developer's I corner know, it kind of was. because <laughs> it literally opens up the the way for people to write their own uh, well audio chops in a way just to mm -hmm. condense sure. it down to that like exactly. um, is there something missing no there's Chuck and Faust so well yeah I think my book arrived but I can't get up to go get it uh oh but it's here it's here <laughs> so, so far. That would be Gil's book, so I would I would recommend it. David, it, David, you have it, right? You have a copy right there. Yes, I have a copy of it. Yeah. Oops. Artful design, and it's uh, just to for people who might have not seen it at the beginning. It's uh, it's in comic book. Uh, yeah. Character. Yeah. Sorry if it's blurred. It is blurred. Comic book style. Automatic redacted. sensor, censoring. Yeah. <laughs> Copyright. And I don't want to plug any products outright, but I don't know what you guys are doing this weekend. But <laughs> no. <laughs> banana beer. Hmm. Yeah, banana bread beer. It's now a thing. So I guess we've come a little bit to the end here. And oh. uh, um, thank yeah. You, thank you guys so, so much for uh, taking all this time and preparing all these presentations for us and and for sharing your knowledge and enthusiasm and just the wealth of what you do yeah exactly yeah. sharing your yeah, work uh, that's huge thank you for having us yeah, yeah thank you yeah. great to finally meet you good because uh, david said oh you guys should uh, hook up blah 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 so it's great yeah. to yeah. hook up yeah. together this way See, David is doing. He's doing it. He, do, we are the Turkey, the Turduck, and we, <laughs> and as well as everyone that's that's, that's on stream. And uh, yeah. yeah, I love the constellation idea. So, um, rock on. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and thanks everybody for tuning in. I guess this was our first in session of the year, Marcus. And this, I don't think we had one in January, did we? No. No, Marcus. this is basically our January. This it's is a little January. bit. Of, <laughs> it's a slow, we'll again it's a a slow year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for agreeing to come on to the show, David. Yeah. That was a, a great. I mean, I like I said before, I think thought, thought your presentation at the summit was was terrific. So this is a great follow up onto what you're thinking about now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
I look forward to the next summit. Yeah, okay. that's what I was going to say. I look forward to, yeah, <laughs> look forward to the next dot, dot, dot. <laughs> With the laptop All right, orchestra. All right. Oh, there was one question. Uh, one of the pictures, uh, actually, at the beginning that you showed, one of the photos, uh, early experiments, you had a laptop with approximately eight mice attached. <laughs> what, what was the instrument there? That was, in all honesty, a, a publicity photo for the very first Chuck Papers <laughs> of the International Computer Music Conference. Those mice, you, those were Barbie mice that we found on the internet for a dollar a piece. I was like, Chuck should be able to connect into all of these, but we weren't actually doing anything with that. We wanted to show that you could, but in that case, so it, that was really, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat embarrassed, but I, I, should, mm. I should tell the truth that that was really, it was an aspirational <laughs> photo. Uh, of course, yeah. now you can, you you can just, yeah, dozens you just, of mics if you want. <laughs> very impactful. <laughs> Sorry. <Really busted. laughs> I didn't mean to. It was yeah, unintentional. It's, okay. it's actually public knowledge. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to always share the, 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 the inner workings as horrifying as they, they are. Uh, yeah, so maybe... Excellent. All right. Um, should we just say goodbye and stay on and chat more in nice. the background? Because we can chat for forever. Yeah, we can uh, chat forever. But we got to say bye to you guys. Bye to the uh, general public out there. So, um, yeah, we'll see you probably in a month. Thanks again for being the guest and sharing your work. Um, this is something everybody can try out. I really encourage everybody to do that uh, because it is, it, it is natural. It's almost natural language in a way when you program in touch going this way is not that far off. So. Um, yeah. See you. Yeah, exactly. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, See everyone. you soon. Thank you guys. Bye. Yeah. Bye.